or maybe still chairman, uh, for uh, pushing me. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Africa has more than 100 species of raptor, and many of them are quite showy and easy to identify, like I have an, a set of such birds here to begin with, like Marshall Eagle, Secretary Bird. I wonder if we could dim the lights a little bit, if somebody's in control of the lights to get uh, the picture to show. And uh, Bachelor, of course. The scissor tail or swallow tail kite. Grasshopper buzzard. But of course, there are birds which are not that easy. And uh, in this uh, talk, I will focus on a few of these groups. There are too many, of course, to cover in 40 minutes. <laughs> Uh, but a few, like uh, the ringtail harriers, which of course are just wintering in Africa. Some brown eagles, which always pose uh, problems regardless of where in, in the world you are. And uh, I start with these uh, brown eagles. Uh, there's five of them, as I count them. It's Wahlbergs, which I start with. Then there's the two spotted eagles, lesser and greater, and then we have step eagle and tawny eagle. And most of these, of course, except for Wahlbergs and uh, tawny, are migrants of, and winter in Africa. But during the winter, our winter, you can see all of these five species, maybe even in the same spot. And this is how the textbooks and field guides want us to perceive a Wahlbergs eagle. It has rectangular wings, rather long neck appearance, and a folded tail, quite long tail. And this is a very typical uh, silhouette of a Wahlbergs, but not all Wahlbergs look like this. This is a juvenile Wahlbergs, and you can see there's straight a difference. It's soaring with an open fan tail. And this is something I think is quite typical, that the adults do keep the tail folded, while the juveniles open it. I don't know if, if the juveniles are less secure flyers and you just need more space, uh, I mean, uh, area uh, to, to keep them flying, or what the difference is. And also you can see that the wings are not that rectangular. They show this S-shaped trailing edge, which is typical of all young eagles. So the young birds have this S-shaped trailing edge, while Older birds have more rectangular wings. And this also applies to the other species. The Wahlberg is a small eagle. It's only buzzard size, about the same size as the booted eagle, which is a, a common wintering species in Africa. And you can see uh, in the past, over the last decades, we've been taught to look at plumages and colors of birds and patterns of birds. But there are many other things that we should actually focus on, uh, like uh, the structure of the bird, how it's built, the different proportions. That can help when the plumage looks straight, strange somehow. The proportions can give us an aid in identifying these birds. And when you look at this Wahlberg's eagle, you can see that it has a very small bill for an eagle. It has this tiny crest that you sometimes see when it's perched. You never see it in flight. And then for many raptors, you have this uh, proportion or, or uh, the difference between where the wingtips <coughs> are and the tail is, how far the wingtip is from the tail tip. That differs from species to species, species depending on if it's a long-tailed bird or a short-tailed bird and so on. So compared to the other brown eagles, the Wahlbergs is a small bird with a tiny bill. Here is an adult uh, dark Wahlbergs eagle, and you know that Wahlbergs eagles come in different color morphs. There are dark ones like this one, and this is the far most common uh, type. Then you have a pale brownish as the juvenile was in the previous picture, and then you have uh, almost white uh, 
white, a little coffee colored, very pale birds. But typical for all Wahlbergs is that if you look at the underwing, there's hardly any markings at all in the flight feathers. And this is another thing to remember that when you're confronting a strange looking raptor, if you can, you should always focus on the pattern of the flight feathers, because that seems to be a standard within a species. Whereas the body, uh, and I mean, the underwing covers and the body can be either pale or dark, but the color of the wing uh, flight feathers remains the same. So Wahlberg's has hardly any markings at all, not in the tail and not in the secondaries or primaries. This is a rather typical shaped uh, adult Wahlberg's. You see if the light is good, you can see that there is a, in old birds you have a, a darker trailing edge like in a buzzard, but otherwise the markings are quite diluted in this uh, bird. Uh, rectangular wings, quite long splayed fingers, which is a good uh, difference against booted eagle, which has a more closed wingtip and not as rectangular wings. Here is another adult Warburgs, very uniform drab looking bird, but uh, I uh, want you to, to notice the rather long tail in, in comparison to the width of the wings. So you can compare the width of the wings is roughly the same as the, the length of the tail, which makes it long tail when we are talking about brown eagles. Here is another juvenile uh, Wahlbergs, uh, a paler brown one, but even here you can see that, that the underwings are practically unmarked. And another uh, important feature is if you see a Wahlbergs from above, from the upper, you see the upper side of it, it has no prominent field marks. It's just brown. It lacks all the white markings that you have in many other species. So it's just uniformly brown. The coverts are slightly paler than uh, the flight feathers. So if you compare Wahlbergs with booted eagle, which can be very similar from underneath, Booted eagle always shows these very prominent pale markings in the wing coverts, in the scapulars, and it has this white hue. The upper tail coverts are pale. So the upper side is often as important as the underparts when you're identifying uh, birds of prey. Then we come to the next group, the spotted eagles, and we know that they are very difficult to tell apart in most cases. But telling them apart from tawny eagle and steppe eagle has also proved to be difficult, especially in Africa, where you can have all these four species wintering together. One very good character is, again, the structure of the legs. <coughs> this is a greater spotted eagle. The typical for both species is that they look very, very long legged. They don't have the bushy trousers of the larger eagles, steppe and tawny. They, they, in old textbooks, they're talking about stove pipe legs, which is quite a good description. So when you see a brown eagle with these long legs, you know it's one of the spotted eagles. Here is another spotted eagle, greater spotted, a younger bird with all these spots in the wing covers. And again, you can see this very typical long leg appearance. And another thing which is typical for uh, the greater spotted compared to all the other eagles, is it that it's always found close to water. It loves water and it needs water. <clears throat> it's hunting by the water's edge. Therefore, you find it around lakes and rivers and wetlands, more so than any other species. There's a juvenile, uh, greater spotted, being harassed by house crows and again, Pay attention to the legs here. A typical juvenile greater spotted eagle. The thing is that when you see it in fresh plumage like this, the upper parts look very uniform. I mean, if you just look at the dark parts of the bird, it's just blackish brown throughout. There's no color contrast between the secondaries and the base of the greater coverts and the rest of the wing coverts or the rest of the bird. It's a very, very dark bird. And then, of course, the number of spots varies individually. So they can be heavily spotted like this bird, or they could be just 
a few rows of spots. Here is another in uh, a, a juvenile in late winter. Uh, something that's also important to realize when you're working with these eagles or trying to identify them <coughs> is that uh, the juveniles can always be told by the uniformity of the plumage. So the plumage has been grown in the nest. All the feathers are growing out at the same time, which means that all the feathers are of similar age. This means that when the bird starts, when the plumage starts to wear during the winter, it wears uniformly. The bird keeps a uniform look. Whereas in adults, older birds, you always have fresh feathers, worn feathers side by side, which gives a very mixed, uh, the plumage looks very tatty. So, uh, when you look at these uh, lesser coverts in these pictures, you can see that they are browner and paler than the rest of the, uh, the, well, the secondaries, for instance. And this is because of wear. So the blackish brown feathers from autumn have faded and worn into browner. And this is a typical trend in, in all birds, actually, that with the, the sunlight and wear of the feathers, black feathers tend to be, become brown. Typical juvenile, uh, greater spotted eagle, easy to recognize by the very dark underwing coverts contrasting with silvery flight feathers. And now if you look at the barring again, which I said is important, typical uh, for lesser spotted, uh, sorry, greater spotted juveniles is that they have silvery feathers with very, very fine barring, and the barring does not reach the end of the feather, and rarely does it reach also the base of the feather. So the barring is placed somewhere halfway out on the secondaries. And this very, very dark uh, body plumage. Here is an older, greater spotted eagle. You can still see the contrast between the dark coverts and the, the paler uh, flight feathers, but old birds lose the barring completely. So both adult lesser spotted and adult greater spotted never show any bars in the flight feathers at all. They're uniformly dark. One of a good feature for uh, greater spotted eagle is the white small little patch here, the moon crescent at the base of the outermost uh, primaries. That's a good species indicator. And here is an, an old adult greater spotted eagle. This is probably the chubbiest, the most compact of all of these brown eagles. Very, very broad wings, very short and broad tail. Seven clearly fingered primaries always in greater spotted eagle. But with age, the black underwing coverts tend to get slightly paler and more mottled. And sometimes you don't see any contrast really between the coverts and the secondaries. And notice how they are uniform, no sign of barring. And we have the other species, lesser spotted eagle. And again, look at the legs, very long legs, no bushy trousers. And the lesser spotted is as the name implies, it's smaller, it's lighter built, and it's also paler, a paler brown bird compared to greater spotted. And here you can see, this is a juvenile uh, in midwinter. So it's, it's pretty worn already, but you can see a clear contrast between the median and lesser coverts against darker, greater coverts or secondaries. So typically, uh, lesser uh, spotted eagles always show a clear color contrast on the upper wing. And also, if you look at the bill, it's a small, rather fine bill for uh, an aquila eagle. There is another juvenile, uh, rather fresh in October, but although this bird is darker than the previous one, you can still see the con clear contrast here between brown wing coverts and very dark looking secondaries. A typical lesser spotted juvenile, <clears throat> and if you think back now of the uh, juvenile greater spotted, you can immediately see that the, the contrast is reversed in the underwing. The wing covers are medium brown, but the flight feathers look distinctly darker than they are in uh, the greater spotted. And also you can see that they are barred throughout 
the barring is, is broader, heavier, and it goes from the base of the feather to the very tip. That's a very good uh, diagnostic feature. And also, if you look at the wing formula, the lesser spotted, especially <coughs> the juveniles, usually have six only, six prominent fingers, and the seventh is rather short and rounded and so can sometimes be missing altogether. This here is a, a young step buzzard. But size-wise, lesser and greater spotted are quite similar. <clears throat> so you cannot use the size in the field because, of course, the size, the impression of size depends on the distance to the bird. But these uh, features, uh, plumage features and structural features are, uh, are good to go by. Here is another juvenile, lesser spotted. You can see a very short seventh finger, really heavily barred uh, secondaries and a clear contrast between darker, or maybe not a clear contrast, because sometimes like here, it appears almost the same if you squint your eyes. You can't see a clear contrast in lightness uh, versus darkness. It's almost the same uh, darkness, but you can see that they are really strongly uh, barred compared to a young greater spotted eagle. And also something that's typical of lesser spotted is that they have like two crescents. They have a small one here, like uh, the greater spotted, but then the base of the primary covers is often pale and forms another pale line uh, further in on the carpal area. This is a modified picture where you have the two together and you can now compare the markings in the secondaries of the young greater spotted with the markings in the secondaries of a, and also look at the wing formula. A young lesser spotted eagle from above, a clear contrast between upper wing coverts, darker, greater coverts, and secondaries. This is something that you never see in uh, greater spotted. And also on average, at least, lesser spotted have far fewer spots in the <coughs> median coverts than greater spots. One feature that's mentioned in, in most of the textbooks is a pale uh, nape patch, which is okay. It can be big, it can be very small, but it's usually very, very difficult to see, even in situations like this. And the only moment when you really see it clearly is when the bird is turning and facing straight toward, coming straight towards you when it's circling, because then you can see the pale patch against the dark shoulder, and it, it stands out really nicely. There is a lesser spotted eagle. This is one year old in, uh, in uh, autumn, October. You can see that it's molting feathers, so it can't be a juvenile because it has feathers of different generations. But still easy to recognize as a lesser spotted based on the barring, type of the barring here, and the rather medium brown underwing coverts. And a very short, also here, a very short seventh primary. Another, this is an adult, less spotted. You can see that uh, the darker the feather, the fresher it is. So these feathers have been replaced only like a month or two months ago or something. And you can see that it's gradually, as the bird ages, it's losing the barring. It's slightly more faded, older feathers still have the bars left, but the new ones are, are lacking the barring. And this is a fully adult uh, breeding female from Estonia. She has a, a reed ring, and she had a satellite transmitter on the back. So we know this bird is old. And you can see, compared to the greater spotted eagle, even as adults, they have very short seventh finger. A clear contrast between uh, flight feathers and, and uh, coverts. And usually the greater coverts form a visible dark band across the midwing. And if you see them close enough, uh, to make out the, the color of the eye. Lesser spotted have yellow, very pale eyes as adults, whereas greater spots keep a, a dark eye throughout life. Okay, the next species is the tawny eagle, which seems to be very difficult for people to, to get to grips with, partly because it's so variable. Uh, you have very pale ones, uh, even paler than this bird, and then you have two very, very dark brown ones. 
it just seems to be individual variation. <clears throat> but this uh, young bird here shows the difference if you look at the leg. They have these bushy trousers and rather short and sturdy uh, tarsi compared to the spotted eagles. And if you look at the plumage on the wing, you can see that all feathers are worn, but they're uniformly worn. They're all of the same generation. That's probably a new feather stuck in here. So this is a juvenile that's close to one year old, but hasn't started to molt yet. So the, the plumage is uniformly worn, and you can still tell by that alone that it's a, a young bird. There is another young uh, tawny. You can see the same condition on the feathers here, very warm, very spiky tips. But this one has started to molt already uh, a dark head. And this is typical of all these eagles, that when they start to molt the body feathers, they first get a dark head. And these dark-headed birds <coughs> have been, well, debated in, in magazines. And you see a lot of photographs, but the explanation is just the molt, that they are replacing this juvenile pale plumage with the next plumage, which is darker. So uh, I think that the pale tawny eagles, really these milky colored tawny eagles, are juveniles. And all the older birds are darker than this. This is an, an adult, or it's not an adult, because you can see it still shows some spiky feathers here. Uh, but most of the feathers have rounded tips or rather already and are in, in good condition. But you can see that there are feathers of different shades of brown or grayish brown in this area. It, it doesn't look uniform, it looks uh, tatty. And also if you look here on the mantle and scapulars, you can see that there are paler feathers, grayer feathers and darker, more fresh feathers. So this is a clear indication that this bird cannot be a juvenile because it has feathers of different generations. This is a young <coughs> tawny eagle still on the nest, but just preparing to, to take off. And you, if you look at the underwing again, you can see that there's hardly any markings at all, which is very important when you compare this to step eagle, which is the next, I mean, the nearest uh, species that you often make or have problems in uh, differentiating between tawny and step. So tawny eagles, hardly any markings at all and very pale uh, buffish, the body plumage. There is another young tawny eagle. Again, you can see this is about one year old. It has started to molt in dark feathers on the on the head, <clears throat> and the crop is full of meat. You can see it's really bulging here, like an apple. But if you look at the underwing, very very poorly marked uh, flight feathers. Here is a young tawny eagle. Uh, chasing a pied crow or hood. And if you look at the upper parts, uh, compare tawny eagle with step eagle, uh, you notice that tawnies are practically lacking all the white markings that are so typical of step eagle. In fresh plumage, you can see uh, rather narrow pale tips to greater covert than primary covert. But apart from that, there is not much else in terms of, of white markings. Also, there is no upper tail. Uh, I mean, the, most of the eagles have these species have white upper tail covered, but these are missing in tawny eagles. So it looks quite uniform. Just the, uh, the lesser and median coverts are paler than the flight feathers. <clears throat> this is an adult uh, tawny eagle. You can see that there are feathers of different age here. And uh, some of these tawny eagles have this very funny uh, plumage with dark streaking. Dark, they can have a dark breast shield with pale streaking. And this often confuses them and people think that they are spotted eagles or, or even imperial eagles because of this streaking. But this is a typical uh, plumage type of uh, tawny eagle. Some, some birds do have it. And this is a more average uh, adult tawny eagle. You can see that there's some more markings on the underwing, rather dense markings, maybe like a lesser spotted eagle, but still somehow diluted. They're not very sharp or distinct. Very broad winged, shorter winged than uh, 
a step eagle, and also maybe slightly longer tail. So the, it has a different silhouette from step eagle, which we'll look at later. This is the tawny eagle with the dark uh, breast shield I was talking about. Sometimes it continues all the way down on the belly with pale streaks. And this is a plumage that you only have in tawny eagles. But it hasn't been uh, illustrated in the books really that well. So that's why people mistake these for other species of eagle. Here is a similar bird to the previous one in flight, where you can see this dark breast shield with pale streaks. But again, notice that there's very little barring in the underwing. And then we have the, the, the last species, the step eagle, which in juvenile plumage is very, very uh, easy to identify by this very broad white line on the underwing. And usually rather uh, strongly marked uh, flight feathers and very broad pale trailing edge to the, un to the wing. There is another bird lacking all the barring. So this is typical for aquila eagles, that there are maybe a few percent of the birds do lack the, the typical barring of the species. But this can easily be identified still by the pale, greater underwing coverts. But all birds don't have the pale underwing coverts, and then you can be in trouble uh, if you don't know the species. You can see, if you think of the previous uh, Tawny eagles that I showed, this is a, a, a longer winged bird, a shorter tail by comparison, more similar in shape to the spotted eagles. Uh, and also this individual has no barring, which is quite exceptional. So there are difficult individuals in amongst the, 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 the normal ones. And this is uh, like a third year, third plumage step eagle and this shows a rather typical underwing barring of step. A lot of coarse bars, quite pale uh, base color, and then quite distinctly barred. But even until quite late, they're still retaining parts of this white <coughs> underwing band. And if you look at this, uh, this is the same age as the previous bird. The step eagle has a lot of white markings on the upper wing compared to tawny eagle. And also the upper tail covers form this white U at the tail base, which is lacking in tawny eagle. An even older four or five year old step eagle, <clears throat> very heavily barred, flight feathers still retaining some white in the greater coverts. And this is a practically an adult step eagle, still showing the coarse barring of the flight feathers, but still retaining some pale. <clears throat> Uh, in the under, greater underwing coverts. And an adult <coughs> old step eagle from above. Although rather uniform uh, in, the, in the greater uh, coverts, they still retain this pale uh, patch at the base of the inner primaries and also retain some white uh, tail coverts. Then we jump over to Harriers, <clears throat> and uh, I want to talk first about uh, structure, because you all know on the left we have an adult male pallid harrier, on the right we have an adult male Montagues harrier, and these images to show the difference in the structure of these birds. So, pallid harrier appears big-headed; it's uh, it's almost like a hen harrier, the shape of the head, big and rounded head, whereas Montague always has a small head. And this is because pallid harriers really have this uh, crescent, the facial crescent that owls have, because pallid harriers hunt also by hearing. They're hunting uh, voles and mice, so they, they're, they're listening for the prey when they cruise slowly over the field. <clears throat> Whereas Montague's harriers are mostly hunting by eyesight, so they're just looking, trying to see the prey. Uh, pallid harriers hunt small birds, and rodents, when Montague's harriers hunt mostly insects, but also small reptiles like lizards, uh, frogs, maybe the odd uh, small bird or, or mammal if they manage to catch them. But they are more insectivorous, and this is a more rapacious bird, the pallid harrier. And if you look at the structure 
typically Montagues <coughs> is short-legged compared to uh, the pallid harrier. Montagues has very long wings, which reach all the way to the tip of the tail, whereas pallid harrier has shorter wings and the tail is much longer. So all these put together makes the Montague a long, quite low-lying bird with short legs, whereas the pallid is a shorter, more compact bird on tall legs. So a juvenile, uh, and these ring tails are known to be very difficult. So if you just think of what I said before, <coughs> compare this is a, a Montagues <coughs> sitting quite low down, compared to this young pallid harrier, with really tall legs, look short winged. And here you can really see the crescent, the color of the pallid harrier, and actually, what makes it so uh, prominent is, is that these feathers forming this color, it's not just color, it's these feathers are actually shaped in a very funny way to capture the sound. It's, they are actually very similar in shape to the feathers found around the facial disc of owls. And this <clears throat> design is lacking, as you can see, it's lacking in uh, Montague's area. So usually Montague's harrier has a crescent of white or pale color here around the ear covers, but it doesn't go all the way from the neck patch around the throat as it does in pallid harrier. So a complete color is typical of pallid. And if you look at them in flight, they can be very difficult in flight. Uh, both species in juvenile plumage like here show dark secondaries and a paler hand. But if you look at the wing tip, usually the, this is a Montague's Harrier, a young Montague's Harrier. The Montes show dark fingers. So when you see them from a distance, they appear to show a rather broadly dark wing tip, like a black triangle at the wing tip when the wing is folded, when, when, they're see, when you see it from a distance. <clears throat> While the Pallid Harrier has similarly dark uh, secondaries but all of the primaries appear to be of the same color because the, the, the pattern is the same from the base all the way to the tip. So this section would be dark in Montague's Harrier. And this is something you can see from a great distance. So if you have a, a small ring tail in Africa, which means either Montague's or Pallid because the hens stay north of Sahara. If you just look at the wing tip, if it's widely dark, it's a Montague's. And if it's just uniformly pale compared to the secondaries, it's most likely to be a pallid. And also here you can see how distinct the color is compared to the color in Montagues. Another young <coughs> pallid harrier, you can see how the, the, the pale neck band goes around the throat. And if during the winter you see any uh, young bird, you can see it's a young bird because of these dark secondaries <clears throat> and paler outer wing, you can see it's a Montague because it has a lot of uh, dark in the wing tip. But if you see any birds with gray mixed in this juvenile plumage, you can be quite sure that it is a Montague's harrier because the, the pallid harriers don't molt any body plumage uh, during the first winter, whereas Montagues do it as a rule. Another young, uh, sorry, an adult female, Montague's Harrier, just to show you the shape. Rather low sitting with very long uh, wings. And you see actually the tail is hidden behind the wingtips. <coughs> Another Montague's Harrier, very long wing, wingtips and tail tip end at the same, more or less the same point. And then an adult female pallid Harrier, very tall, very tall legs. And you can see, although it's not as pale and, and distinct as in juveniles, you can see that the color goes all around the neck. Then we're moving on. Vultures. <coughs> Rupel's vulture, an interesting <coughs> bird. This is like a typical adult Rupel's vulture, uh, rather darkish with this scaly plumage on the body. You see the undertail covered here and same kind of markings you have on the under wing covers. And then it has this very white line close to the leading edge of the wing. 
Another rupel species photographed in Spain. So this is one of the West African birds reaching Spain. Uh, a lot of Spanish uh, griffon vultures go to migrate to West Africa for the winter. And when they return in spring in May, they bring with them uh, the odd rupel vulture. Maybe 10, 20, 30 birds every year. And this is one of them, very dark. And you can see this really gleaming white line in the underwing. Scaly plumage, something that you never see in griffon vulture. <clears throat> and a third bird, also from Spain, showing again the same things. Scaly plumage, some anchor-shaped patterns here in these feathers, a white shaft streak with a pale tip. And this is how you see it from a distance. <clears throat> when it's high up in the sky, it just looks uniformly dark with this white line close to the leading edge. And a juvenile repels very different from a uh, griffon vulture. It's rather grayish brown and really, really prominently streaked all over. And still you have this very pale line close to the leading edge. And compare this to a, a griffon vulture here, <clears throat> which is this yellowish mustardy color, hardly streaked at all. If you compare the color and the pattern, very different looking birds. When we go to East Africa, the, the thing changes because in East Africa, the birds tend to become paler. And this is a typical East African bird. It's more like a griffon vulture, but you can still see the dark bases to the feathers <clears throat> and this scaly appearance of the upper wing covered scapulars and mantle. But very different from the West African, very dark looking birds. But then you have, among these, you have really odd looking birds. So here is a rather typical East African repels vulture also here. This is a white back. But if you look at this bird here, it doesn't show any of the repels marking in the wing covers. If you look at the scapulars here, you can see, yes, it has some. But this stands out from the crowd, <coughs> definitely. As does this bird. <clears throat> Looks very similar to a griffon vulture. But then when you look for small details like the undertail covers here, you can see that it is typical, a typically marked repels vulture. But this color and this uniformity is very, very strange. And these birds, I think, are the explanation to all the claims, well, at least most of the claims of griffon vultures in East Africa. I think they should all be checked again <clears throat> because uh, in those days, nobody knew anything about these pale-looking uh, rupels vultures. So this is a, a sub-adult rupels vulture. You can see it still has a few juvenile feathers left. These spiky brown things are still juvenile feathers, so it's about two years old. The bill is still dark. <clears throat> but you can see this rather uneven pattern in the upper wing cover. So a griffon vulture would not look like this, although it could be a very similar looking. This is a griffon vulture at the same age. You see, it is absolutely uniform here. The lesser and uh, median coverts are just uniformly, well, uh, medium brown, it can be gray, more grayish brown, also has, still has a, a darkish uh, bill and a darkish eye, and the outer uh, primaries are juvenile and a few odd secondary. So they can be, this is the repels, this is the griffon. Here is an adult breeding repels from Ethiopia, <coughs> where I think the most difficult birds are. So this is very, very close to a, a, a griffon already, but you can see that there are some dark spots here and there in the upper side, and compare that with a griffon of similar age. Very, very similar looking birds. If you don't know that these pale repels exist, you would probably mistake them for griffon vultures when you see them. And this was the final proof that they are uh, oddly colored repels vultures. This is a juvenile repels vulture photographed in Ethiopia some years ago. And here is another nest in the same colony. You can see the adult here, and here is a young one that hasn't 
fledged yet. This is the nest site here. And you can see that they are very, compared to the first juvenile I showed you with this brownish, grayish brown plumage, heavily streaked, this bird has nothing to do with uh, a group, uh, sorry, a rupels, a normal looking rupels. So what these birds are, I don't know. Uh, but they look so similar to griffin vultures that you wonder, maybe griffin vultures had a, a, a thing to do here uh, somewhere along the line. Or then it's just a, a plumage morph that hasn't been described before, but there's clearly something interesting going on in Ethiopia in these birds. And I think what we need is really DNA studies comparing griffin vulture, rupels vultures from different parts of Africa before we get the answer. <coughs> And the last but not least, the, the kites in Africa. <clears throat> in the past, they were all called black kites, and nobody was really interested in them. And uh, that's a pity, because the black kite is one of the most uh, interesting raptors of all. It has a very wide range throughout the old world. It's in Africa, it's in Australia, India, and so on. And everywhere you have these geographically different uh, populations, subspecies or species. But now when the African ones have been split uh, as uh, the yellow-billed kite, as you can see here, an adult yellow-billed kite from Africa, from Ghana, and it's easy to tell by the old yellow bill, not just the sear, but the bill itself is yellow. <coughs> the adults are easy, <coughs> but because the juveniles are very difficult, so pay attention, for instance, to the wing formula. Typical of the African yellow bill is that the sixth finger is very, very short. Also, it has a, a rather narrow tail, quite clearly forked, more clearly forked than the European black kite. It looks slimmer. It is somehow more similar in shape to a, a red kite than uh, our normal, so-called normal black kites. <clears throat> this is a black kite, European black kite, an adult. <clears throat> and if you see a pale head, you know it's the European one. The African never gets a white head as an adult. And also, if you see that the eye is pale, it's a clear indication of a European black kite. Because the African, they retain the dark eye throughout life. And the thing, of course, is that all our European black kites migrate to Africa for the winter. So you can again have all these groups, all these different types of black kites together in the same flock. This is a European black kite uh, photographed in Ethiopia. You can see the gray head, not in this picture, but in other pictures you can see that uh, the eye is pale and also the, the sixth finger, it's clearly a fingered uh, primary, not blending with the trailing edge of the wing. And the wings look somehow broader, it looks a little bit heavier than the African uh, yellow bit kite. This is exactly from the same spot as the previous one. So this is a lake in Ethiopia. This is on the same trip, just a few moments later, that a kite looking like this appears. And when you have a black kite with this much white in the wing, in the primaries, you know this is one of the eastern birds from Asia, from Central Asia or even further east, maybe all the way to Mongolia or uh, because the European black kites don't show white like this, and neither do the African black kites. And birds looking like this have been seen all the way down to Namibia. I know somebody sent me pictures from Namibia of a bird looking like this. So, East, sorry, uh, Central Asian birds or Asian birds can migrate as far south as Namibia. That we know for sure. So there's like three types, different types of kites to look after next time you go to Africa. The African yellow-billed, European black kite, and then this uh, Eastern black kite with these white wing flashes. The problem is the juvenile, the young birds, <clears throat> because this is a, a juvenile African yellow-billed kite. And as juveniles, they don't have the yellow bill. They have black bills. You can see by the plumage, it's very fresh really just nearly fledged. This is from uh, January. So a fresh bird looking like this in January in Africa cannot be a European bird because our European black kites are born 
hatched in summer. So by uh, New Year, they would be quite worn already. So this fresh bird has to be of the African population. And also you can see that it's very rufous, really quite colorful compared to our black kites. <clears throat> but this is also a yellow-billed, juvenile yellow-billed kite. So some of these birds cannot be told from European black kites, in my opinion. I could, if I was shown this picture, and even if I was told that it's taken in Africa, I could not say that this is uh, a yellow build, a young yellow build kite. Only when I don't know the date that I took this picture myself in January, I know that no European black kite could be in such uh, uh, perfect plumage half a year after hatching. They would be rather worn and miserable looking at that point. So the young ones can be really, really tricky. But if you look carefully at these African black kites, already when they're young, you can see <coughs> that the bill, it's only really the, the outer part of the bill that is black. Whereas in the European black kite, the, the whole bill is really, really black. And it, there's a very distinct contrast with the uh, yellow sear. Whereas in both <coughs> these cases, you can see that that the, the dark doesn't really reach the sear. It, it gets slightly paler towards the base. But of course, in the field, this can be impossible to see. Here is a young uh, African black kite, sorry, <laughs> African yellow-billed kite. Uh, with a, it looks, the bill looks dark and the sear looks yellow, but it's still, I mean, this would be another very, very difficult bird to identify from uh, a European, young European black kite. Here is one from Ethiopia. This is a one-year-old bird. I mean, it's, you can see it has just started to molt for the first time in its life. It's, it's lost a few inner primaries. <clears throat> this is the, the very worn plumage that I'm talking about. That it's uniformly worn, but it's worn all over. And also the first new central tail feather is growing. And if you look at this bill here, you can see that it's already getting grayer at the base. It's not black, it's just gray. So that's a typical one-year-old uh, African yellow-billed kite. And if <coughs> I zoom in on the same picture, you can really see that it's getting pale here already and also at the base here. So during the first two years, they will turn yellow-billed. But before that, they can be very, very difficult to tell from. Uh, European black kites. Here is another one-year-old bird. You can see that it's really worn, uniformly worn. All the feathers are of the same uh, generation. <clears throat> and also here you can see that the yellow is breaking through here and there in the bill. But the eye is still brown. So I hope you all got interested in kites. Next time you go to Africa, it's not just the black kite. It's, it could be anything. It's worth noting. And this is the final plumage, <laughs> sorry, not the final plumage, but the final image. Uh, just showing that there is a lot of material in Africa, if you go to the right place. <laughs> this is Dakar uh, at sunset. And I've been there a couple of times in winter. And we estimated something like 5,000 yellow-billed kites coming into the city to roost on the lampposts and on the antennas and various places <clears throat> for the night. So that's all, folks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dick. Thank you. I know that when I go birding in Africa, uh, in Kenya with my friends, these groups of raptors are one of the most difficult for us to tell apart. And I think I've picked up a few tips from you today. Yeah. And your images are just simply out of this world. So thank mm, you thank so you. much. Thank you. Um, if I understand it correctly, you're kindly agreeing to do some book signings at yes. tea today. Yeah. So if you don't mind, I think we'll move on to our next speaker and take take questions. Mm, okay. um, if, if, if you have any for, for Dick when he's signing books at tea time, we can try and make up a bit more time, if that's okay with you. Thank you. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Sarah Havery. 
Um, Sarah works as a species recovery officer for the RSPB with a focus on international priority species and supporting local partners to deliver conservation projects. Her role involves supporting partners with projects on critically endangered species in Kenya, Ethiopia, and the UK overseas territories. Her main interests and expertise lie in island restoration, and she's been involved in conservation projects in Mauritius, the Isles of Scilly, Antigua, Henderson Island, St Helena, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. This afternoon's presentation from Sarah will summarize the work to date led by Nature Kenya and partners, including, of course, the African Bird Club, to safeguard 